What's going on y'all, it's Javon.ca and we're here again for another episode of 100 Ways to Make 100K. And I've got someone very special that I wanna introduce you to. Now, he's the host of the Offers Accepted podcast. And no, I know what you're thinking, it's not a real estate podcast, it's way better. Now, he's also the founder of something called HiredHippo.ai, a bunch of tools for recruitment, and the founder of and CEO of Linkus. You know, I'll let him tell you a little bit more about what he does and what these companies do, but I'm very excited to introduce you to none other, the one, the only Adam Gellert. Wow. I feel <laughs> like I'm just like walking into this amazing room. That was a great intro. Thanks so much, Javon. I appreciate uh, uh, you being here. Um, I appreciate you for having us, man. I'm really excited to dive into your story, learn a little bit more about, you know, where you're at right now, how, what it took to get here and where you're going. But before we do that, maybe you could share a little bit about some of the key milestones, um, key circumstances, key events that kind of happened in your life that makes the Adam that we're sitting in front of today. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a, a long story, I would say. Hey, man, we got um, time. <laughs> the, you know, I mean, people know me as uh, the, the, the recruiting guy, um, you know, recruiter Adam. I've been in the recruiting space for 25 years. I'm obsessed with recruitment at every stage, retention, attraction, uh, and I have just kind of made it my mission to make hiring better for both employers and candidates. I think it's a very messy space that's still done very traditionally. So uh, about 15 years ago, I started uh, the our agency, Linkus Group, with kind of like the one idea that you want to go for repeat business, care about your customers more than anyone else. And what I noticed when I started the business is that recruiting was kind of seen as, you know, this this industry where people would kind of just throw candidates at companies and hope somebody would stick and they wouldn't really focus on the long term goals and, and gains um, that companies would have and candidates would have of being connected uh, very, you know, naturally uh, together. And so you know, building that business, um, you know, 15 years in, we learned a lot. Like I, I've, you know, done a lot of things in the space. Uh, I sat on the board of the HRPA events committee, which is the governing body around HR um, in Canada. And I do an event once a year, Disrupt HR uh, Vaughn, which is just north of Toronto, uh, for, for anyone that, that, that doesn't know the Toronto area that well. Um, and then, while we were serving our customers, which are typically companies that go from one to 100 people, they're SMBs or small, medium sized businesses and startups. And uh, maybe it's an HR team of, of, of zero, of one, um, and, and the founder um, kind of, you know, trying to get the highest quality talent in their team in the fastest amount of, you know, in, in the quickest way possible. Wow. And we, you know, just realized that the tools that we were using that everyone's used to in the marketplace, indeed, LinkedIn, you know, the, 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 the typical um, actors in the space, right? That there just wasn't a really good way to connect with the highest potential talent, hmm. the top 1% of candidates within their industry, um, because most great people don't necessarily apply to jobs. Uh, they're not always seeing your job posting. They might not be actively looking for work. Hmm. And so we created Hired Hippo as sort of this, you know, uh, very high potential marketplace. That's where Hired Hippo comes from. It comes from hypo, which means high potential. Hmm. And, and, and yeah, we just wanted a more curated approach to candidates and companies connecting. And so that's kind of the, the story of where I am now. Cool. Now it's, it's funny that you that you describe hippo because I'm like, okay, he must have loved hungry, hungry hippos or something. Like, where does the hippo really come from? But now that you say high potential, it, it makes a lot of sense. So nobody's really born saying, oh, you know what? I love HR. I love culture. No, like, how how do you fall into this space? I would love to learn a little bit more about your journey even before starting the company. Yeah, most people fall into recruiting. Um, they don't think about it as a as a career. Um, you know, I had no idea what recruiting was before I started. Uh, it kind of, I was traveling Australia and somebody that I had worked with previously in retail called me up, uh, and, and said that, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm building a recruiting agency. 
Uh, and I was like, what the F is that? <laughs> you know, uh, and, and they basically said, yeah, we, we you know, make money to, to intro great people to companies. Um, and I think you'd be really, really good at it, right? So it's not something I'd ever thought of, but I basically flew back, you know, from Australia when I was backpacking there, uh, you know, I think it was like three weeks later, um, and basically just started out of this uh, individual's kitchen table and kind of like learned. And I just fell in love with, with the industry. I felt like it was something that I was, you know, really good at. Um, and, and I feel like I, you know, cared about it so much, yeah. but making those great, great connections that it kind of uh, took off. Um, and so, you know, prior to that, I was, you know, I think part of the story is that I, I've been working like three jobs since I was 13, right? Okay. I was just, you know, it's just kind of in me to, to, to work and, and, you know, I've always had to make my own money or my own way. Mm -hmm. Um, and so trying to figure out what to do in my kind of place and, and, uh, you know, as a career, uh, just doing a lot of jobs really, you know, made me realize that like, maybe I'm good at helping other people find their right, you know, mm -hmm. career and companies finding the right people for them. Cause it's all about alignment with those jobs. And I worked at a, a vet clinic actually. Um, that really was, suits you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I wanted to be a vet. So, okay. so yeah, I was working at the vet clinic and, and you know, the, the, uh, veterinarian who was actually like a father to me, he, he said, you know what? I think your, your path is, is, is entrepreneurship. It's business. I think, you know, you've got that kind of risk taking, you know, attitude. I don't know what space that would be in. And so when I got that call from you know, like my, my former boss, friend, friend of mine at the time. Yeah. Um, it kind of just clicked. So that's kind of how it started. Wow. Now that, that must've been a lot. Like how old were you when you were working at the vet clinic? Well, I worked there from the time I was about 13. Uh, cause I like volunteered there just, you know, taking care of the, the dogs and cats, okay. um, cleaning cages, um, you know, oftentimes getting there at, you know, six 30 in the morning, wow. um, cleaning, cleaning, you know, soiled cages and, yeah. and 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 taking the dogs out uh for a walk right um cleaning them up making sure that they were uh great um and probably till the time i was about 20 i guess wow i'm um, just through school and so when when did he tell you that he thought you were right for entrepreneurship i'm guessing it was closer towards the end yeah it was closer towards the end because i had you know had it in my you know thought process that i wanted to become a veterinarian yeah um but it just didn't fit with how I thought about school. I was mm -hmm. kind of always, you know, just not thinking about school in the way that you need to think about school to become a true veterinarian. Yeah, same. Um, Dude, same. I didn't think about university until I got there. And I was like, oh, this is what's going on. And I still didn't even have a clue until like the end of it. And I'm like, oh, okay. People had this dream from high school. I'm like, oh, what? How did you guys get that? So at 20 years old, you hear from, you know, like in your mind, you're like, okay, I'm going to be a vet. And then all of a sudden the vet that you look up to tells you, I think you're right for entrepreneurship. W what did that kind of like manifest as? Like wh what were some of the next moves after that? Like, did you jump right into it right away or was it confusing? What, what, how did you process that? Yeah. I mean, I think I remember the, the moment in time exactly. Um, it was kind of just one of those aha moments in your life or mm -hmm. like revelation of what's mm -hmm. um, kind of transpiring. And, you know, I think, you know, life is about listening to those cues and, you know, following in that uh, path that could potentially lead somewhere. And so, uh, yeah, it just kind of got me thinking. I mean, no, I didn't dive in because I didn't know, you know, what kind of business I wanted to start or how I would get there, what I would do. I had no idea, right? Um, and, uh, like, my parents aren't entrepreneurs. My mom started a, a computer company teaching people how to use computers for a bit on the side while she also was going to school and having you know, doing another job. So I kind of learned my hard work from her. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, I kind of got to the point where like, hey, you know, I'm going to figure it out, but I had no timeline in, in play. Yeah. So how did you end up in Australia? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, well, everyone else was going to university. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. Right. So a friend of mine um, and me just decided like, hey, let's, uh, you know, take this dive and go, you know, check out Australia. I worked on a farm, wow. um, picking capsicums, they call it, like okay. you know, red peppers. And uh, I worked at a hotel. 
uh, did a lot of just different odd jobs there, which was like, you know, I, I think just, you know, part of who I am, just want to be learning what other people do, um, different avenues that you could potentially take. So uh, it really helped, you know, my career and my trajectory in terms of what I wanted to be doing. Got it. Now, do you remember the first time you made a hundred grand in a year? Oh yeah, for sure. All right. Take us back. So you weren't picking capsicums anymore. <laughs> no, no, no. That was, uh, that would have taken a while. I, I, I a lot really of red pink. peppers. So you picked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, it was at the time when I, you know, I guess a few years into recruiting, mm -hmm. um, when, uh, you know, just realizing what relationship building is like and, mm -hmm. and, you know, repeat business from customers and just doing a high quality job in the fastest way possible, um, putting other people first. And so, you know, uh, making that hundred grand and, and getting those, um, I guess, successful wins proof, mm -hmm. um, that this is where you should be doing cause you're getting paid for the work that you're doing. Yeah. Uh, was just kind of proof that like, you know, this is where I should be. I never, you know, had that kind of money or thought about that kind of money before. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't even really, I do what I wanted to do well, but I never really thought about money in that way previously. Yeah. So after, after making that, did your perspective on money change? Um, I think so. I mean, it didn't really change, you know, I guess who I was, but, mm. um, you know, I, uh, a lot of my friends were at, in school at the time and they weren't making money. So, you know, I'd be the person to, you know, buy drinks at the, at the bar or, uh, you. say, Hey, I'm going to lend you some money, yeah. um, to maybe get this done. Right. So, uh, just be kind of a very generous with, with, you know, time and money in, in that sense, right? Like it didn't mean that much to me personally. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted other people to, to, to live in that success. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I think it changed from a dynamic of like, you know, I felt good that I could like actually like help other people. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I thought further ahead, maybe if I go back in time, I would say, you know, hey, you know, take this in stride kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for the coffee. <laughs> way, you know, <laughs> I, you're still buying us drinks, man. And I really appreciate it. So now, how did it, what were you doing at the time when that happened? Was that after starting Linkus? Was that coming back from Australia? Like, where were you in life when you crossed that first hundred mark? Yeah, I was working for the company that I worked at before I started Linkus Group. Um, when I went out on my own, I had to start back from scratch. So um, you know, the decision to do that was I kind of just wanted to take my career in a different direction and, um, you know, very amicable in terms of I'm still friends with those uh, founders that I worked with before, but I kind of wanted to take my career in a sort of different path, mm -hmm. um, work with different clients. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to me, it was important to not work with the same clients that, you know, we had been working with previously. So I had to completely start everything from scratch. And I was really at the point where I was like, you know, is recruiting for me? Um, you know, I, like, I obviously love like the, the success and financial aspect, but the, the way that the industry kind of operated didn't feel like it was me. So it took me a while to figure out, you know, in order to make it the industry better as a whole, yeah. um, I'd, ha I'd have to start my own business. Mm. And so I did go back to catering. I went back to, you know, sweeping floors for construction, went back to those, like, you know, three jobs after I'd already got to this point mm -hmm. um, to kind of get me to the stage where I had to like basically start again from the the bottom and move up. And, uh, you know, as I decided to start Linkus Group, I was just very um, obsessed with how I would create the brand, how we would stand out, what we would do. And I just basically started just calling and asking people if they give me a shot to help them hire the best person in their company. Um, and, you know, slowly over time, uh, you know, I was able to reach that hundred K again. Um, it was during the financial crisis. So it was, you know, didn't happen right away, mm -hmm. but, um, I think that's what makes entrepreneurs. You have to be ruthlessly persistent and resilient, uh, with, you know, what you do and you have to kind of take everything in stride. So and I, I really appreciate you being willing to go back to sweeping the floors. You're like, whatever, I was here before, like, 
I'll just sweep the floor and take three jobs again. Like, <laughs> and it's cool to see, like, at this point, you're an expert in getting jobs. Like, let's face it, right? Like, you've got more people jobs than some people have ever seen in jobs in their life, right? Like, I've had, like, maybe five or ten or something like that. And you probably got ten people jobs this month, probably even more, <laughs> right? So it's, it's really cool to see that that's something that you're actually really good at. Um, and it kind of goes back to you being 13 with three different jobs, like something that you've been doing your whole time. So it's cool to see kind of how it's evolved over time. So now at the start of Linkus, right? The, you said, right when I started, I just had to pick up, a, pick up a phone and make some calls. Like, do you remember that first client? Do you remember how you got them? You remember the story? I would love to hear. Yeah, um, I think the company was uh, Canadian Blood Services, if okay. I remember correctly. And really it was just, you know. It was a dark and stormy winter night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't remember, if I remember that clearly, but yeah. uh, you know, essentially um, I just had to go back to basics, right? Mm -hmm. um, like you said, like, you know, I don't feel like I'm, you know, above any job. Like I still take out the garbage, uh, you know, at our office. And I just believe that, um, you know, devils in the details, like we just need to kind of um, do whatever it takes. Um, mm -hmm. And I just want to be very humble, no matter how much, um, you know, I make and appreciate like, you know, uh, generations before me and how I got here. Right. Mm -hmm. So I just, uh, you know, just followed those same basics right um just remember you know somebody agreeing to say hey um you know we're willing to work with you uh i believe it was like a facilities manager type role so it was a role that i had never worked on before never had any business starting to do um but i just had the raw confidence and drive um to get it done and that's kind of you know it's been you know my core since i started in in recruiting was like you know i know the core aspects of how to align and match people and mm. listen to cues of, of you know what people are looking for and what companies are working for and you know how, how to mix those cues together um and i think that's 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 the core of of making a really good match and just you know i, I even went back to recruiting for veterinarians because i just wanted to prove to myself that i could do it yeah. Um, I did it once and I don't think I'd do it again, yeah. <laughs> but, um, I just wanted to continue to prove myself with like these like obscure roles and positions mm. to kind of figure out, you know, what is our niche, mm. um, which is like, you know, now we, we focus on executive, uh, search, uh, revenue operations, engineering, um, you know, finance and, and revenue type roles mm -hmm. for, um, typically for SMBs and startups, as I mentioned. And so you know, that type of focus, mm -hmm. um, you know, came from just trying to kind of trying everything. Right. Yeah. So what about that niche, you know, spoke to you? And if you were to go back and, and start with no niche, like, how would you go about finding that? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I think, you know, ending up on a niche is, is, is important. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think it comes back to what I kind of advise people that are kind of trying to figure out what they want to do and how to get that job that they want mm -hmm. um i think that a lot of people don't know what their superpower is mm -hmm. and what they want to be known for there's a book by seth godin which is a very famous marketer called linchpin and it um you know talks about you know the the type of person you want to be known for right okay. um so that when somebody thinks of a job they think of you mm -hmm. right for that particular job to be done um and jobs are just like business problems that need to be solved right mm -hmm. i need this you know dog cage cleaned i need this product sold um you know all those things right so from from that aspect like we just you know have to figure out what we want to be great at mm -hmm. and so trying to you know prove to myself that i could try all these different things to get down to that niche that i thought was um you know had the best tra trajectory mm. um and the most impact mm. um on customers is kind of how we landed on what we do interesting how long do you think it took um or sorry how long did it take uh would you say to find that niche right because a lot of <clears throat> a lot of times like when especially when i talk to like creatives they're like mm, like how do i choose a niche right like how do i know which route i want to go down 
and it's it's um, i don't know to me it feels like it's at a buffet right it's like how do there's so much food here yeah right like how do i know what i want to put on my plate and I, i'm curious what like how long it took you to find that perfect meal for you how long it took you to find um that niche like what was that process like because like yeah. you mentioned you tried everything right yeah, it's, it's what Daniel Pink says, which is the paradox of choice. Mm-hmm. You know, if there's too many choices, then you can't make one, right? So trying to figure out, um, you know, with a smaller subset, how do you get there and, 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 and do that one thing? I think when you're trying to figure out your niche, it's like you, it's a bit of gut. Like you just kind of, you know, you feel it, it feels right. You know, you get that check to prove it. Um, someone pays you for what you're doing mm. or someone says, Hey, you did a great job and this is why you did a great job. So it's that, um, you know, uh, success metric okay. that, that ends up happening. And I think, um, you know, you might not know until you find it, but I think, you know, generally, uh, you know, there's a term in HR, it depends. Um, <laughs> so everybody's, everybody's different. Look, like p- humans are, are very different. That's why humans are great. And that's why. Uh, you know, building teams with a diverse, you know, humans is a great thing to do because you get this diversity of thought mm. and opinion and experience. Um, but I really think it comes down to the theory of 10, you know, 10,000 hours um, to get really good at something. Right. And so until you do something 10,000 times, 10,000 hours, um, you know, I don't think you can even start to call yourself great or an expert mm. um, until you've put in that work. And so once you've done things at the 10,000 or 10,000 feet, you said you went skydiving, which is awesome. So once you've done some- wild, <laughs> wild, yeah, yeah, I mean, like that's super impressive. You must have thought, whoa, like, you know, I'm so high up. There must be uh, the world looks so low below. Yeah, um, I've never done it go on skydiving but I oh we're gonna imagine. go I, done yeah we should go done yeah, yeah yeah yeah. i'm taking you there's someone else that was on the show that i'm gonna take too oh. so we'll do it all at the same time and it'll be a pretty cool experience now that you said you haven't done it we're going okay yeah, amazing. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no you're doing it <laughs> Dude, so look I, man i was like i'm gonna die like this is it this is the end mm-hmm. right and then i remember i was talking to the the guy as like we're getting hard to stop right and i'm like so how many times have you done this right and he's like like in in my life or like today and i'm like Mm. oh okay (laughs) like it just put everything into perspective right because i'm going skydiving for the first time and this guy's like yeah yeah i did eight jumps today you're like number nine and then i've got like five more and i'm like huh and i'm thinking like this is the end this is the beginning of the end like um let me send my mom a message let her know like this is you probably won't see me again you know i'm falling out the sky in dubai and who knows what's gonna happen after that but after uh touching my feet on the ground it was the craziest experience but wow. that's not the point that i'm trying to get across right it's like there's people that have done the thing so many times before like mm-hmm. what are we scared of mm-hmm. you know like we we have this risk in our head like even some people coming up to you they're like oh i'm scared to trust a recruitment company you're like bro we've, we've hired we've played like 20 of these roles in the last week like we've got i've got someone for you and they're like no i'm a little scared and it's like dude trust me like <laughs> and he so i asked him like how many jumps in your lifetime he's like i don't know maybe thirteen thousand, i think and i'm like damn wow. and when you really think about it it's like wow there's people that have done this thing many times before um where i could i could lean on their experience and it was uh it was really an eye-opener and it was cool to see the earth from that that field of view definitely like i, I enjoy flying drones and stuff like that and that's kind of yeah, cool. like super cool but it was crazy like actually seeing it in real life it just puts it puts so much into perspective you know i'll leave that for another another conversation though no but, it's it's very um you know it, i think it fits right like you when you said your feet touched the ground you just kind of knew like oh that was that's great but you kind of had to get up there and do it right yeah so yeah it's one of those things it's like you you know but you have to put in the work to do it i yep. don't think uh you can't just expect it to happen mm-hmm. you have to you know, you have to put in the work, you have to put in a lot of hard work and hours to kind of get there and, yep. and, uh, you know, be known for something. So, yeah. So what do you want to be known for? Like, I'm, I mean, you mentioned you're the, you're the guy when people think of like, I need to hire someone and you're the guy, you know, how did you find your linchpin? Yeah. I mean, I, I want to be known as the, the number one person to go to when you've got questions about hiring. Like, mm. you know, I, I, uh, I, I think that, hiring is overcomplicated like it's more people overcomplicate it mm-hmm. it 
is actually easy if you run it down to basics. But most most people take too long to hire. Um, they make too many mistakes. Um, you know, they consider hiring very hard. And uh, if you break it down uh, to sort of like the a, a science in a way, um, or you know, baking a cake in terms of like specific ingredients to get that you know cake right. I'm yeah. not a baker, but yeah. I think uh, you know it's just uh, you know certain things that are required to mm -hmm. make sure that you've got a really good hire and i want to be known as that person that you're gonna go to i think i always lead with um trust attitude and passion mm. um you know i i do everything with with high integrity high trust i'm very passionate about the people that i work with and the companies that i work with i want them to succeed more than myself like it's it's you know uh, in my opinion, I think like a coach, like you want to put other people first, mm. get them to be elite and, and, you know, and then the, the success will come. Right. I never think about, I know this is called, uh, you know, hundred K. Um, I never think about the hundred K. I just think about the process to deliver great results mm. and that kind of hundred K will come. That's kind of how I think about it. Yeah. It's like, it's like mission first. Yeah, you know all, all the all the accolades, all the all the finances, all that things a byproduct of doing good work. You know, it's like how can we serve, you know, to the to the highest of our degree. So, what do you think most companies um, should rethink when it comes to hiring? Right, like you mentioned, there's there's a ton of mistakes that you see. Like you've put in the work, you've done the hours, right? So there's probably especially a new company that's going from one to a hundred. What are some things that they might be overlooking? Yeah, um, I mean, it again comes down to it depends. Everyone's yeah. different. Best answer. But um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah, it, it really comes down to alignment. I mean, I think the number one mistake people make is they try to hide things. They're not transparent about um, what the work environment actually is because um, they're worried. They're worried like people's perception of of how they're going to think about it. You know, hmm. maybe you know if if we're a three days in a week of office, somebody is not going to like that. Um, if they're seven days in the week office, somebody's not going to like that, right? Everybody's different. There's always going to be a great person for that particular role. Um, you know, you should definitely treat people well and, you know, run a really good business. Uh, there's nothing that takes over for, for that. But um, in terms of how you operate your business and perform your business, um, just really be very open and honest hmm. with your uh team and then people that you meet um and interview about what it's like to work there mm. um the the number one reason people kind of leave jobs is because it wasn't the way that it was explained to them in the interview mm. and you just never want to have anyone have any surprises but the same thing goes for candidates i mean um there's a lot of candidates that just don't do the work to find out does this company align with my interests is it going to hit my career goals right so you have to understand first what your uh, superpower is, um, what do you want to be known for, and then you know focus on the companies that can help you get there and provide that work environment that's going to work for you. Hmm. So that's it. that's interesting, especially as I as I think about growing like myself and my organization. It's like, what am I really looking for, and what do I really want to attract? Mm -hmm. So I think I think that's a really sound piece of advice, man. I really appreciate it. I think attract and repel is super important. I mean, a lot of people know how to attract talent potentially. I mean, not everyone does attract the right people, but you also need to know how to repel hmm. uh, the people that you don't want working for you, right? But so, and that's just being like authentic. Yeah. Um, and how do you do that? Like, if you're if you're scared, right? Because there's because right. there's like this this it's like this catch twenty two, right? You're like, oh, I want I don't want this type of person. I don't want this type of employee. I don't want this type of client. And then you get them and then it's like, oh, will I ever get another one? Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, I need this problem solved now. Like maybe I should take this, you know, like how do you, how do you navigate something like that? Well, I think it just goes back to, you know, in integrity and honesty. I mean, I think anyone listening to this, uh, this podcast, um, you know, might remember a time when they were tricked. Mm. Maybe they were tricked into a job. Maybe they you know, were tricked into buying something. Maybe they're tricked into a relationship. And how that made them feel afterwards, you're pretty terrible. And um, like they were like something was kind of taken from them. Right. 
So you might go into uh, an interview and then it, when you go to discuss salary, it's like, you know, it's commission only. And they were like, okay, well, I'm not a commission only person, right? Mm. Or it's, it's less than you want, right? Like all these things get discussed too late in the game mm. um, and it reduces the trust and it really hurts the business. Companies don't see it right away, mm. which I've really noticed over the last 20 years that I've been doing this. It's like they don't see it right away, but over time, Mm. The most successful businesses, the ones that exit, the ones that, um, you know, uh, have great glass door reviews, have great um, retention of their staff are the ones that are just, you know, no matter what their culture is, they're just very honest about it. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, they're honest about who they are um, as a, you know, what are their they're very self-aware, mm -hmm. I guess. So I think. You know the, the biggest thing is like yeah it's it's tough to do and that's why most people don't do it and they mm -hmm. get it wrong mm -hmm. but um you know once you can be kind of self-aware about the type of company you want to build like you mentioned yeah, yeah. then uh just be very in intentional about that yeah at, 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 as you keep discussing i can't help but think about um the cost of losing great talent right and <clears throat> what do you think like for you and from the things that you've seen, like what is, what about hiring and HR hurts companies the most? Yeah, I mean, definitely making um, a mistake. It could change the course of your business. Uh, mm -hmm. You might not even see it. It could be an opportunity cost. But if you look at, you know, all the, the greats, maybe if you don't like them totally, like, mm -hmm. you know, Steve Jobs, things like that. I mean, just hiring great people, um, is going to change the course of your business. You're going to uh, you're going to see things that you didn't otherwise see, um, put people in positions that you might not be able to to, to fill. So I think a uh, you know potential mistake that recruiting in HR make is just not being able to figure out how they can hire these great people. Right? Mm -hmm. um, maybe they don't look at their business holistically or from an outside view um, or get a consultant um, to, to to look at their business in a different way yeah. um, to be able to not make those mistakes. Mm -hmm. I mean, hiring is always going to be super risky, right? Mm. Um, you're never going to get it right 100% of the time, but you want to reduce the risk, uh, you know, every time that you go out and hire. Mm. It's, it's the best, it's in the best interest of the candidates. It's in the best interest of the company. It's in the best interest of everyone else on the team. Mm -hmm. So you really want to reduce those risks um, in, you know, in the best way you can. And there's a, there's a lot more context to that, but yeah, I don't know if we have you know, time on this podcast. Yeah. To if you, if you want to dive into it, man, I'm all ears. Like I'm captivated right now. I'm, I'm learning so much. I feel like I'm being taken to school right now. Oh. You know, these are the things in HR class that I wish I learned, but I didn't, you know, <laughs> thanks professor. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm, I'm go, were you about to go ahead? No, I was just gonna say, yeah, I'm, I'm humbled by that. I'm just like get super passionate about the space. Um, and uh, you know, again, I've put in the ten thousand hours. So yeah. Now, do you remember the first time you made a hundred grand in a month? Yes. Okay. D dive in. Like, at what point? At what stage of business were you at this time? How how old was the business? Um, what were some of the things that were going on in your life at that time? Yeah, I don't. I don't know exactly. I tend to just look forward so i can't pinpoint the exact time um but i think it was somewhere around you know three ish or four years in mm -hmm. um and i remember just jumping on the table uh putting on i think um the song by c2c uh this band i can't remember what the song is right now but uh just like being really excited because i think it was you know it's a it's, it's a feat for um, you know, all, all the hard work that you've put in, right. Mm -hmm. It's like you kind of expect that it will happen because yeah. that's what your vision is and that's what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. Um, but it kind of changes and makes you realize that, you know, if you could do a hundred thousand dollars in a month, you can do a lot more. Right. Yeah. It's, so. it's almost like a new beginning. Like I know we were talking about new beginnings, mm -hmm. you know, off camera before this, but I think that's another one of those moments where it's like, holy smokes, what's next? Like, if I just accomplished this, like the sky's the limit, right? There's no, there's literally no stopping this. We can go all the way to the moon. Now you mentioned something about vision and I'm kind of curious about how it's changed and evolved over time, especially because when you first started, like this wasn't necessarily 
the objective, right? Like you're like, yeah, I'm just backpacking in Austria and my friend called me with a cool opportunity. I'm going to come back. Actually, hmm, let me change this thing, right? And it, and it seems like it's evolved and evolved and evolved literally from Blinkist to Hired Hippo. Um, like a, even that's a like nice little pivot. So I'm, I'm curious how the vision has evolved over time and where you think it's going. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think the core vision has always been, you know, I, I want to change people's perception of recruiting. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a very broken space and I want to um, show people that there's kind of, you know, another way to do things, right? Mm -hmm. That it actually make you more successful. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, in terms of like my own vision and, and mission, yeah, that's changed, right? Like, you know, how I wanted to build the business. Um, uh you know do you kind of grow at all costs right um you do you, you know i mean i i work a lot like i don't I, it's hard for me to stop working mm -hmm. but you know that type of um that type of push i mean i think that changes over time and mm -hmm. uh you know changes based on the type of people that are in your company um i think that you know when you when you create uh, either if you're a solopreneur, if you're on your own, or you're creating a business where there's going to be other people, uh, you all have to be rowing in the right direction. Mm. Uh, I think that's just, you know, something that a lot of people talk about, which is obvious, yeah. um, but maybe not talked about as much, right? Yeah. So, easy yeah. to say, not, not necessarily easy to do, right? Exactly. Now, what is, so you keep mentioning the space is broken, the space is broken. Um, I'm not in the recruitment space. Mm -hmm. I also don't recruit to the same degree of the businesses that that you're working with like these smbs going from one to a hundred what about that space do you think is broken um and what are some of the ways that you're fixing that yeah good question um so i i, I don't go you know an hour without people calling me to complain about um you know what's broken in hiring well i appreciate uh, you putting your phone on silent <laughs> yeah exactly exactly <laughs> so yeah just anywhere from you know, how we get introduced to jobs, what jobs we take, the application process, um, you know, the, the transparency, how people interview. Um, some people try to interview and trick people into answering certain questions, um, onboarding, which is like 90% of recruiting, um, the, you know, how, how you retain, stay interviews, just all the way through, right? To someone being there 10, 20, 30 years, taking over the company. Wow. um you know like 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 tim cook is taking over apple for example mm -hmm. right so or, or has taken over apple obviously uh so it's just it's a very broken process um all the way through i think we started with the application process with hired hippo um we said hey let's take one piece um and try to reimagine mm -hmm. what it's like to apply for jobs where and then we looked at all the things that um great candidates complain about right what are, what are some of them so it would be you know i don't get feedback from my application oh yeah i have to create multiple applications and like you know 100 different portals portals whatever. and job boards um i'm applying to jobs that i don't know what they're about right like there's no transparency in terms of the the work environment how much company how much money that company makes um who's the person that i may be meeting with right so just being able to prepare for the interview mm -hmm. um, and, and salary expectations, like all those things mm -hmm. that you expect to get upfront, that you get when you talk to a recruiter, mm -hmm. um, but you just don't see as an application online. Mm -hmm. And then getting them to a decision maker as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the person that I'm gonna be working for is the person that I care most about speaking with. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'm talking about people that are high potential they're like you know uh they've, they've kind of been there done that right mm -hmm. um you know they want to be talking to the decision maker right away yeah um they want to know that this is a good fit for them because time is everything right so if they're wasting any time in the process mm -hmm. um you know resumes like you know if, if you have been there done that like i i can't tell you like there's this the, the pain in people's eyes mm -hmm. when they're like oh i have to put together a resume i haven't done that in five or six years because you know, I've been working at the same company, right? Mm -hmm. And we have LinkedIn. So there are all these, I could go on forever. There's all these reasons 
why sort of like the job application process is broken. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the, the, the last thing is like, I think the way that matching has been done um, has been done very poorly. Right. And that's one of the things we're absolutely the best at that we have sort of a cult following around um, in our business where um, candidates just love the matching process. They've, they are able to uh, apply to 100% of the roles that they see because those roles are a ideal fit for what they're looking for based mm. on their interests, right? Mm. So the app kind of works like a dating app. It kind of came from the idea of dating apps where it's like, if I tell you what I'm interested in, what skills, experience I have, mm -hmm. and what jobs I want to see, that's going to be a curated experience for me. I'm going to just be able to uh, not have to go and search. If I'm, if I'm employed and working in another company, I don't have to go you know, search for uh, a number of jobs and, and apply to ones that I don't hear back on. So that's yeah. super, super key. Um, and I think, you know, is, is just the scratching the surface of, mm -hmm. of kind of revolutionizing this industry where um, indeed in LinkedIn, the, you know, the stat is that I will only interview maybe 5% of the applications that I get. Mm -hmm because they're just not a good fit. People yeah. are just trying to apply to apply. Yeah, people just click apply, 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 apply. Exactly, there's yeah. the click apply. We don't let people do that. Mm. Um, and we don't let them do it for you know good reason, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we want to have a 100% success rate. Mm -hmm. So every application that our clients get is gonna be somebody that they at least wanna interview and mm -hmm. potentially hire. Mm -hmm. There's no time wasted, mm -hmm. no having to go through unfit candidates, no having to explain to unfit candidates that you know, it's not a good fit. And same for the candidates, like they don't have to go through jobs that aren't a good fit for them and aren't gonna be the right for their, their family, their interests, you know, all these things that people look for in um, a job or career. Yeah, I really admire um, the, the empathetic approach. You know, like you, you've designed, or at least it sounds like you've designed all these tools, all these processes with both users in mind right like the, the job seeker and the job uh well i guess the hirer or the employer right you know like it, it's it's really cool to hear um what it's like from both sides i was recently with someone that was that's been hiring uh cfo and mm. they're like man like this is the most painful process like they're getting 30 applications a week on linkedin and he wrote or not linkedin but um indeed mm -hmm. he wrote the instructions on how to apply and like none of them are applying i think he ended up hiring but it was still kind of like a, a pretty, I'm not going to say funny, but it was an interesting experience to watch. I'm not hiring a CFO, not yet anyways. You know, I'm not, I'm just not at that stage, but it's, it's very cool to see um, some of the, some of the pain points and desires of some of the people that are further along the path than me. Um, now there's, there's some people that might be starting out their company and looking for that first hire. Are you, are you the person who's going to help that first hire? or is it more mature in the stage? I'm kind of curious what you see as um, like the, the need for the smaller business versus the need for the bigger business. Uh, yeah, it's very interesting. Um, so yeah, we are the type of company that will help with the first hire. We do that all the time, day in, day out. Yeah. Um, something that we've got 10,000 hours on um, and have a lot of success to prove it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we work with companies that you know are just one person, they're looking for their next um hire to take over a portion of what they're doing to do something maybe pointy or uh you know hire a bit of a swiss army knife to do um some other things to take off of the founder's plate um and yeah we take companies from one to a hundred and, and and beyond yeah it's uh you know it, it's really tough i would say one of the toughest things is making that first hire mm -hmm. um you know typically it's somebody in your network maybe it's somebody you know maybe it's somebody uh, that was introduced to you. Mm -hmm. um, typically that feels very, um, you know, uh, less risky uh, for a lot of people. So that's 10, you know, potentially the path that they go down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in hiring to get the most diverse pool of high potential and the best people is you want to know that you've kind of cast a wide net, mm -hmm. but you don't want to have to meet with all those people, mm -hmm. right? Because then like you said with the CFO example, Fine. It's a waste of time and there's opportunity cost that's lost. There's, mm -hmm. there's your time. There's so many other factors that um, really hurt the business mm -hmm. and other people on the team that's taking so long to make that hire. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, with, with 
uh, I think your other question was around like small company versus big company. Mm -hmm. um, you it know, depends. I think <laughs> right? it depends. It depends. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I think what's like small company is that, um, you know, I, I think there's care at every stage, but I think that it's a different type of care. Mm -hmm. um, when you're a small company, um, the, the, the people that you add make probably, you know, 10 X the difference of the type of the amount of people that you have in your, in your company. So mm -hmm. if you have, you know, 10 people, it's like, you know, it's, it's going to be have a huge impact. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when you're, you're, you're hiring in a small company, like you have to be that much more intentional about the people that you bring in because every person that you bring in is going to add to the culture and the core of the business. Yeah um which could which could change and it just becomes that much more multiplied is my point um than if you were at a bigger company now what's been one of the more impressive things that you've seen that a company's done to maintain their culture as they grow yeah i mean um i think it's just again back to the transparency and honesty like who do we want to be um, what type of company do we want to become really getting, you know, continuing to challenge that mm -hmm. and that chat status quo. Mm -hmm. um, I see a lot of times when a company gets like a large funding round or they get uh, to a certain size, mm -hmm. uh, eventually like over 50 um, uh, is, is tough. And then over 100, um, the core of the company really changes. And I think the great ones uh, really stick to the core values and they hire around that. Mm -hmm. uh, they also conduct stay interviews around that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, are you still getting what you wanted out of uh, this organization? Mm -hmm. uh, the same as when you started, right? And if they say yes, that's not necessarily a good thing because you want them to continue to get more and push for more, mm -hmm. right? Um, so there's all these, these aspects that you kind of have to look at. Right. um during that you know that, that that culture change process yeah and you know you seem very well read um like i, I noticed earlier you mentioned a couple different authors and a few books and some of the things that you learned from them i'm curious if you were to name like maybe top three just favorites in general could mm -hmm. be any subject and then maybe top three around hr culture recruitment etc cetera, etc cetera. um what are what are some of your faves yeah, I think a book that not a lot of people I hear talk about, um, which I really, really like, is called Black Box Thinking Okay. Uh, by Matthew Syed. Um, it's just about, you know, how pilots have a checklist of what they need to do before they take off. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of reframing, uh, you know, how you do what you do. Mm -hmm. It's a really, really great book. Um, I really enjoyed Green Lights by Matthew McConaughey. I think that was a really sharp book. Um, and I really like the book Purple Cow uh, by Seth Godin. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just a, you know, something that, you know, hadn't been done before and just like a really cool way to think about marketing yourself and, and what you do. And then from a business perspective, I think the topics are books are Radical Candor by Kim Scott. I think that's a must read for um, anyone at any point in their career, um, especially people for, for leading and managing a team. Basically just talking about how to, um, you know, get really straight on how to communicate um, and be, you know, have, have candor, <laughs> obviously, when you, when, when you uh, connect with your team. Um, and I would say, uh, Lynchpin by Seth Godin uh, that I mentioned earlier that just really understanding what is your superpower mm -hmm. um, and yeah third one's kind of you know escaping me I, I, I would kind of go back to a podcast maybe like the Naval Ravikant podcast um, I just think it's good for any person to kind of uh, think about personally and business wise yeah, I really, I really appreciate you sharing, and I'm excited to dive into some of those. Some of them have read, some of them haven't. So, <laughs> I got some homework, and I'm super pumped up about it. So you're hosting this podcast now, Offer Accepted. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that, some of the other things that are going on in your world and where people could find you. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. So yeah, Offer Accepted, uh, we're probably about six episodes in. Uh, we kind of had been thinking about doing a podcast for a while, but weren't sure sort of like the angle that we wanted to take and you know i am kind of obsessed with 
podcasts I really love, you know, on my walk or on my drive. That's like my go to of what I would, um, you know, listen to. And I felt like a lot of podcasts told stories about people within recruiting in HR. And so um, but none of them kind of honed in on like one particular problem. Mm. So with Offer Accepted, basically the concept is that we're going to take one hiring problem uh, that needs to be solved. So should you pay someone to do an assignment in an interview? Like, should you actually give them cash mm. to do that assignment? Um, you know, uh, other topics would be, you know, how to grow your career internally. Mm -hmm. um, and so we don't talk too much about with the guest about their story but we talk we uncover that one subject mm -hmm. so that people kind of like learn something about that one subject when they when they leave yeah um so yeah that's the podcast um what else you got cooking up where can they find it yeah so uh i have recruiteradam.com is uh, okay. a website where you can kind of you know right, um right. find find all the things obviously on linkedin i spend most of my time on linkedin um Adam Gellert, uh, there's a, there's a hippo there for now. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you're ever in Toronto, happy to, happy to chat. This is, uh, you know, where I am most of the time. I mean, I love traveling too. So maybe, cool. maybe I'll see you in another well, city. Well, the next Cortado is on me. That's for sure. <laughs> so if you were to go back and talk to the Adam that was like, uh, after you came back from Australia, you're working at that company and you were kind of like starting to feel some stuff where it's like, mm, Maybe this isn't for me. If you could talk to that Adam, you know, what advice do you think you would have for him? And uh, yeah, how do you think that conversation would go? Hmm. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I don't think I look back as much as I should, but you know, I, I'd probably say like, um, you know, continue to trust your gut. Mm -hmm. um, you know, take opportunities as they come, mm -hmm. right? Really always be on the lookout for opportunities mm -hmm. um, because, you know, luck meets hard work and opportunity. Uh, and um, yeah, just, uh, you know, I, I would think like, you know, probably just like focus on wealth, health, happiness. I feel like I did that too late in life. Huh. Um, I was kind of just, you know, just like kind of just going, right? Um, with really not much direction and then kind of, just hit me yeah um where i'm like okay this is how i'm going to build my company i want everyone in the company to focus on wealth health happiness mm. um i want them to be doing something that at the end of the day they're still inspired by um and you know they come first they can you know there's we can create opportunity that kind of thing so yeah. i think um i think that's super important uh, in my opinion cool well we appreciate you sharing and uh yeah that's a wrap. Unless you got any questions at the top of mind, anything else that you want to share? No, I mean, thanks for having me. Like, uh, definitely do that Cortado Dude. and a skydive at the same time. Try to keep it in, in the keep it in flight. A Cortado in the sky. Well, you got to yeah. stay tuned for the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, man. We really, we really appreciate you being, uh, really appreciate you being so generous with your time. You know, I know you got a jam packed calendar and I really appreciate you carving out the time to chat with us today, share your story and you know kind of a little bit of the things that made adam adam so once again ladies and gentlemen that's another episode of 100 ways to make 100k i'm your host javon.ca and on this episode we featured adam gellert the founder of linkus and the founder of hired hippo he's revolutionizing the hr industry as we know it so if you want to learn more a little bit about him we've got some links in the description but other than that we will see you on the next episode of 100 ways to make 100k where we're on the hunt to find 100 different ways to make 100 grand a month and this one was adam gellert we'll see you in the next episode peace